Okay, welcome. Espresso Yourself Coffee House. You, yay. It is, um, do you need the open mic list? Mm -hmm. okay. We're a grassroots organization. <laughs> um, do you believe it's June 30th? Does this mic sound all right? How about this one? I can't believe that it's June 30th. Here, try this one. And, um, yeah. I would like to thank First Parish UU for giving us this space. Uh, I'm a member here, and um, it is... Oh, you can just leave it there. And um, I'm uh, very appreciative of what they allow us to do here because they believe in community, which is wonderful. Um, I'd also like to thank Medfield TV for the uh, camera back there with the delightful camera woman, Thea. <laughs> I seem to have slipped into the role of hostess and Thea has slipped into the role of camera woman. Thea, so um, that's where we are. <laughs> yeah. Tonight's theme is making adjustments. And of course, I've done my homework. And I have a little patter for talking about making adjustments. We have a full roster of open mics, which is wonderful. And then we'll take a break, and then we will welcome Tom Smith, our uh, feature performer. So, I found many things on making adjustments in life. And um, I'll read the first one. The, pes the pessimist complains about the wind, the optimist expects it to change, the realists adjust the sales. Isn't that good? That's William Arthur Ward. Yeah, I thought so too. And here's a quote by Jimmy Dean. I, oh. Jimmy Dean's quote, I can't change the direction of the wind, but I can adjust my sails to always reach my destination. I thought that was brilliant. And I keep thinking Jimmy Dean is the guy that makes the sausages, but is that right? Yeah? I don't know. Ah, I don't know. And here's another one by Theo Epstein. Baseball is a game based on adversity. It's a game that's going to test you repeatedly. It's going to find your weaknesses and vulnerabilities and force you to adjust. That adversity in the big picture is a really good thing because it shows you where your weaknesses are. It gives you the opportunity to improve. I think that's why baseball is such a hot thing for uh, a sport. What's going on? You okay? Okay. She's not behind the camera. So I have failed to get any laugh out of anybody, so we're going to start. Aha, <laughs> uh -huh, that worked. <laughs> did you laugh? I did. Okay, good. Um, our first um, open mic tonight is going to be Sarah. Please welcome Sarah with a big hand. David McCord is a poet who wrote a book full of poems and was at the Children's Museum one day about 37 years ago when I was there with my baby son and uh, he autographed a book of his poems called The Star in the Pale. And uh, we had a few favorite poems that I used to recite to the kids, they loved it. This one is um, about making adjustments. When I go to the dentist, I take him all my teeth. Some of me's above them, but most of me's beneath. But one is in my pocket because it grew so loose that I could even fit a string to it and tighten up the noose. But I shall grow another, dentist says, and, sa and shall not need to noose it. Another still to drill and fill? Not me. I won't produce it. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you, Sarah. And you memorized that all those years. That's wonderful. Okay, I don't think Ted Barone is here. Is that correct? He had emailed us that he wanted to be here. Okay, so before moving on, I want to say we can't avoid age. However, we can avoid some aging. Continue to do things and be active. Life is fantastic in the way it adjusts to demands. If you use your muscles and mind, they stay there much longer. That's very, very true. Okay, next. Da, 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 da. Richard Brown. Yay, Richard. This is. Is that okay? Yeah. This is an original story, so I don't have any notes, but it's about an experience of moving to Harvard Square in the 1970s, which, I, interestingly, was a bit of an adjustment. And the 1970s in Harvard Square was a time a hotbed of the, like, the counterculture. And actually, the place where I moved to, ironically, I just learned a fun fact. There was a woman, young woman, who had lived in that neighborhood about 10 years earlier, five years early in 1968, who was sent to McLean Hospital with what a Harvard psychiatrist characterized years later as hippie-phrenia, hippie-phrenia. <laughs> anyway, she wrote a book about it called uh, girlhood Interrupted, which eventually became a movie with Angela Jolie, so that's a little trivia. But anyway, back to the 1970s, when I moved there, I moved into a house where people were practicing yoga, and it turned out that on every street corner there was a different group going on, and uh, one of my housemates characterized it as gurus galore, even suggested there should be a musical comedy about Harvard Square. But anyway, there were... Um, Buddhists meditating, uh, Hindus chanting. Uh, near the uh, Episcopal Divinity School, there were Sufi dancing. And um, even though some of you might not remember Brother Blue, he was carrying on st storytelling near the uh, Harvard Education Library. So that was the context. And my original theme was going to be the secrets of a faith healer. And it has a little bit of neuroscience for Thea's benefit. And, but I wanted to tell a little bit of the context. And around this time, there was a, there was a um, book that came out by a Harvard Divinity School professor called Turning East about how all the young people were incorporating elements of uh, Buddhism and, and meditation and other practices. And even though many of them had never been to uh, India or Tibet or Japan, they were enjoying these elements of these cultures. So that's sort of the context. But my housemate who told me about all the gurus and so forth, he said, you should stop in and see this fellow on Green Street. He's sort of a healer. And his name was uh, Carmo, so I went to see him. And uh, he had uh, a sort of reputation as a healer. There were Harvard professors that went there, and they, including the chairman of the psychology department. And he was written up in all kinds of newspaper articles, including one tabloid that had the headline, Faith Healer to the Docks. <laughs> and uh, apparently, um, he sort of caught on. And they even did a study at, at the Harvard Infirmary that the students got better when they saw a car move than when they went to the infirmary. So the, uh, what intrigued me was he told me his secret, the secret of uh, his faith healing. He said, you know, my secret is that I heal through BS. He, he didn't use the abbreviation, but uh, anyway. So uh, what he did was he would somehow be, know exactly what to say, and he would inundate you with compliments, sort of like Dale Carnegie on steroids, and uh, he, we call it positivity. If you hear enough positive things, you can't help but feel a little bit better. So I recall a book that I had read when I was in college called Persuasion and Healing that said that a lot of being sick is just this general demoralization, and that if you feel better, you'll have fewer symptoms. This was a theory was developed by a psychiatrist from Johns Hopkins, who in World War II found that people who were told of this um, parasite infection tend to exaggerate the symptoms because they thought terrible things were going to happen. So if you have a positive attitude, it's like the placebo effect you actually do get better. There's actually stories of people who were in the control group in clinical trials who had miracle cures just because they thought they were getting treated. So that's anyway, the secret of the faith here 
is uh, positivity. So that's my story. Yes, I think that's actually very true. Life's very, very challenging right now, and uh, anything we can do to, to improve our attitudes and how we feel about ourselves is going to help us deal with the world. So I'm all for that. Okay. I realized that, all, that everything that I took uh, down for my little patter today is kind of dull. So uh, in that moment, while Richard was doing his thing, I've come up with a few. Common sense is like deodorant. The people who need it most never use it. <laughs> All right. Whoa. <laughs> okay, score. If a telemarketer calls, give the telephone to your three-year-old and tell her it's Santa. <laughs> okay, moving on. <laughs> okay, next up is John. Come on up, John. John's been coming, as with Richard for as long as this coffee house has been alive, so. Hey, let me try sitting in this chair. Oh, really? It's a little tippy. in the town of Dover, they have a reasonably successful um, lifetime learning program as part of their Council on Aging. And the most popular course there just so happens to be fun with the ukulele, where people go to class, uh, they learn how to play the uh, ukulele, the group is getting bigger all the time. Uh, originally, it was just attended by women, and there were about 20 women in this group, which is when I went to their performance that inspired this uh, poem. So now they're up apparently to 37 people, and they've got a substantial number of, uh, of male students. At any rate, um, they invited me to their sing-along. Um, often when there's musical training involved, they'll conclude by having a public performance. Um, I went through that a lot many years ago with the Charles River Chorale and Millis. But anyway, these um, up-and-coming ukulele stars invited me to their sing-along, and I thought it was quite good. So, with that uh, in background, um, I share with you a poem I wrote shortly thereafter called The Ukuladies of Dover. Back in the 1950s, I sometimes watched Arthur Godfrey play the ukulele on television. Do you all remember Arthur Godfrey, at least some of you? Okay. Decades later, I met up with a ukulele once again. The ukuladies of Dover invited me to their sing-along. They played and sang well. They reminded me that this land is my land. A little hard to believe in this day and age, but a comforting thought nonetheless. They also conveyed some sad news. Darling Clementine didn't survive her accident. And my Bonnie lies over the ocean. She's now geographically undesirable since I don't have enough money to cross the big pond. But it was still a happy event. The ukuladies are my sunshine. They make me happy when skies are gray. They form a phalanx against old age, sickness, and death. These ladies will not go gentle into that good night. You can bet on it. The day will come when the saints go marching in. 
the ukuleles will be right there marching with them, all on their way to a better place. After all, God needs the company of some good souls. He also needs a ukulele band. Thank you. <laughs> was great. Hot off the press too, it sounds like. Okay, let's see. You will never find anybody who can give you a clear and compelling reason why we observe daylight savings time. <laughs> Just saying. Just saying. <laughs> California may get rid of it. Oh really? Oh that's news I haven't heard. Okay, next up on our open mic. Ted, are you ready, or do you want? Um, come on down. Let's let's welcome Ted Barone. Is it Barone or Baroni? Barone. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Thea. Thank you, Thea. You're welcome. Um, as I understand it, the uh, theme for the evening is adjustments. Well. Uh, this is sort of about adjustments. I think the, uh, this poem that I wrote, I wrote it back in 2015. Uh, it uh, has had a little bit of a shelf life. It's about one of my children. But it's also about an adjustment that, uh, that my wife and I had to make uh, along the way. And I'll explain that a little bit more later. And it is called, I hope there's at least one or two sports fans in the audience or hockey fans. It's called, Goalie Dad Blues. And I think I might have broken the mic, but that's okay. I'll handle it. I'll, 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 I'll do it. Oh, okay. No. Uh oh. Technical. Hold on. Technical difficulties. And who's, who's the crazy person who put all the lights on here? It was me. <laughs> that's a nice touch. Yeah, that's not going to work. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Ooh, look at that. Maybe I'll stop. Goalie Dad Blues by Ted Barone. Dad of a goalie, he sure knows pain. Anxiety and tension sure to drive you insane. Fans turn against your boy when they don't know his name. Give up a score, effing goalie to blame. Defenseman may stink, forward can't shoot. In case of no points, give the goalie the boot. Hey, mama, mama, got the goalie dad blues. Feeling that tension from my head through my shoes. Son, pitch me a shutout so the pain goes away. Or buy shots of tequila so I can get through the day. My stomach is churning, my face feels raw. When a tough shot comes at you, I throw out my claw. And even though I can't help you because it's you on the sheet, it's like my nervous reaction helps you not to get beat. Defensemen may stink. Forwards can't shoot. If our team gets no points, give the goalie the boot. Hey, mamacita, got the goalie dad blues. Feeling that stress, though I've paid my goalie dad dues. Son, pinch me a shutout so my stomach's untied. Or get a big contract, buy your old man a new ride. Stand by the glass, listening to <clears throat> shit. I only feel safe when the puck's in your mitt. A kick save, a stick save, a poke check will do. Johnny Bauer, the man, has got nothing on you. For those assholes who say an NHL thinks you're too small, you're a normal-sized human possessing goalie skills all. And while I'm at it, organizing my scrawls, any real hockey Krishna knows you've got mega-sized balls. The pundits don't get it. The puck's tiny small. With your quickness and brains, height don't matter at all. Think about Hashik, Cujo, Tim T, medically diagnosed as compete times three. Our DNA pool gave you only a start. No empty suit coach could ever measure your heart. Defensemen may whiff, forwards don't shoot. Other side scores goal, it's the goalie they use. Hey, my woman, got the goalie dad blues. 
Don't read save percentage, lest I know it's good news. You set them up so they think they see net, but their leather or glass is all that they get. You read the play, but still one step ahead. Fast twitch, push, fast twitch, push turn, and scoring chance dead. Lone drive to the crease, band, backhand roofer sees twill. Quick goalie cover angle, sorry, penalty kill. Your hockey geometry casts a large pall over snipers who think that they know it all. And even though sometimes it looks like you're beat, goalie robbery prevails, you superior athlete. Defenseman may fall, wing no back check, opponent big goal, goalie, what the heck? Oh my God, got the goalie dad blues. Never do that status, my mind I would lose. Thankful for me, your big game play has treated me well, forged my easy pathway. Your hours of sacrifice, hard work, and sweat are branded on my brain so I never forget. The enduring car rides to rinks far away, feeling the pleasure of watching you play. There were many young goalies just like you, and only one B-Rad, constantly true. To the game and position, both things you adore, to the annals that matter, you are goalie legend and lore. So now I'll stop whining about those blues. Mom says, Ted, let's go on a cruise. Long ago I told her exotic places we'll see, like Peoria, Elmira, and Tallahassee. It doesn't matter, we always have fun watching the man, the goaltender, our badass son. Every time I hear it, but bad to the bone, I can only think of big game Brad Barone. Thank you. <laughs> Just one word, the, the adjustment is my wife said a long time ago when uh, we got married, you know, I'd really like to go to Hawaii for our honeymoon said, well, you know, all right. It only took me 30 years to get her there. <laughs> we just celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary. Yeah. Yes, oh. we uh, uh, have been to Peoria, Elmira, Knoxville, uh, just about every place you can think of down south watching our son play. But only now did she get to go to Hawaii. Oh, <laughs> Work the way. <laughs> Wonderful, that's wonderful. You know, that almost has a rap to it, like you could put it to music. Not a bad thought. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Our next open mic is Miss Libby. Miss Libby is a friend of ours who joined us. And thank you. You want, you want to? I'll try not to knock over the mic. Yes, I'm going to actually lower this. So, as you're possibly driving through midfield, sometime along the road you might have seen a sign that said, this is the home of Hannah Adams. And who, you might wonder, it was Hannah Adams. This is the only date I will give you. She was born in 1755 in this town to a big family. Her father was kind of strange. He'd wanted desperately to go to Harvard, but he had a delicate constitution and couldn't meet the needs of the rigors of Harvard. So he became a wandering bookseller on horseback, on foot, and he was known as Book Adams. Unfortunately, Hannah had some of his um, constitution she too was, was too weak and nervous to go to school, so she just read books at home. And after the revolution, she had to try to make money with her needle. And she was awful at it. She couldn't do handiwork, she couldn't weave straw and braid it, but they had to rent out some bedrooms in their house to Harvard students. And those boys, you know those Harvard men, they said, wouldn't it be fun to teach this little girl, Hannah, Greek and Latin and geography? And so they did. And so she learned the difficult subjects and was able to tutor other boys in those subjects. But then she really needed to start earning money. Couldn't do it with her needle, her pen. 
she would try writing books. Did she write poetry? Oh no. Did she write novels? Oh no. She wrote history books. Now think of it. At the end of the 18th century, how would you do your research? <laughs> couldn't go to the library. Certainly couldn't go to your computer. But she did know some famous relatives who had fine libraries. The last name Adams. Hmm. She was related to those Adams. So the first book that she decided to write was a history of all of the religions of the world, starting in alphabetical order with the <laughs> Albanians. She did. It even sold a little bit. She had to go into New Boston and lurk around bookstalls to try to memorize the books. She was very good at memorizing books. And, and then she decided, well, here I am in a new country, and we have a new history. I will write a history book. So she wrote a history of the new country. It was sort of doing all right. And then she said, you know, I think I will modify it for all of the students. Look at all of these schools with all of these scholars who will need the book that I write. So she modified it for younger readers, but at the same time, Reverend Morse, the father of Samuel Morse, decided to do the same thing. And she said, oh, but I'm a poor spinster, and I really need the money. Too bad, he said. Well, they went to court. She had friends who were lawyers. She didn't really win, but she liked to think she won the moral victory. Her next book, what should, did she decide on then? I will write a history of the Jews. Why? Because she knew Reverend Morse would never write that. <laughs> Hannah liked to say, if you see a book and it says by anonymous, that's a lady who doesn't need the money. If you see a book that says, by a lady of Massachusetts, that's another woman who doesn't need the money. But if you see a book with the author's name on the title page, she needs the money. So that is one of our local daughters of Medfield. I thought you might like to know a bit about her. Thank you, Libby. Libby, Libby does reenactments of several famous women in the, in the local area. And actually, um, is very popular at it, so that's how we met you. It's wonderful. Our next open mic is Ms. Barbara Ella Prentice. Let's give her a hand. I think it's fine. Can you hear me? Yeah. Up until the age of 15, I celebrated my birthday on June 3rd. You see, I was born on a small island in the middle of the Aegean Sea. I came to America against my will at the age of two and a half. And shortly after we came, my mother died, and I was raised by relatives, and I was to assure people I had a fine childhood with some problems, but I made through, here I am. And uh, so at around the age of 15, my sister was 16, I was 15, my father said, girls, you have to apply for your citizenship papers. Go up to my bedroom, in the closet there's a metal box. Go get that box and bring out your visas, because we had a visa to come to this country. So I went upstairs, took the box up, took out the visas, and I, I did a double take. You see the word, John, you know this, the word June and July in Greek are very similar. Junio, Julio. And the way those were written in, it wasn't printed, you know, they were written. I ran downstairs and I said, Daddy, Daddy, he said, what? Was I born in June or July? He looked at me, he said, what difference does it make? It's only a month. I said, what? 
I've been following the wrong horoscope. No wonder my life is a mess. <laughs> I always made jokes. So June 3rd comes and goes, and the truth is, let me tell you, I never told my classmates I was 15, but I never told anybody at school because June 3rd would come along, and back in the day, those of you of a certain age may know that when you got to be 10, 11, 12, 13, you would have your friends make corsages for you. They would have a corsage when you were 13, they'd put ribbons and bows, and then you'd have like dog, bis dog biscuits, and then 13, 14 was charms, and then bubble gum, and sweet 16 were those little sugar cubes, because you were sweet 16. And 17, there were lemon drops, because when you're 17, you're sour, you know, from sweets to sour. But anyway, so the more corsages you had, the more popular you were. So didn't it make sense? Why would I tell anybody my birthday was July? Because then school would be over, and I'd have no corsages. So I kept it a secret till around 18, 19. Well, I have to tell you, on the island of Patos and in all of Greece, they do not celebrate birthdays. So my husband, my dear late husband, John, had a very bad memory, and my sister would call him up in the morning and say, John, don't forget, it's Barbara's birthday. By the time he came home, he would forget, and I don't ever remember saying, happy birthday, Barbara. And then I confront him nicely, though, because we got along really well. I said, John, he said, Barbara, we didn't celebrate birthdays in Greek. We only celebrated name days. So we're near Barbara, December 4th is your name day. We wouldn't, I said, but you're living in America now. But anyway, I got used to not, having birthday celebrations, so. Anyway, finally, I decided it was time to come out of the birthday closet, and I do celebrate my birthday on July, which is coming up July 3rd. So if you'd like, you can wish me happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> happy birthday. Thank you, Barbara, happy birthday. Thank you. I'm hearing the reminiscences of a birthday song. Our next um, storyteller is Ms. Penny Post. Now, let's see. I was waiting for all your little patter, thinking I had time to adjust. Oh, I have, I have tanked on my patter this time. <laughs> <laughs> so don't move that because oh, it's, it's that's water. That's delicate. This right. one is, uh, is this one low? My goodness, I guess it is low. Yes. OK. Hello, everybody. I grew up in Wellesley, Massachusetts. Leafy trees, safe roads, nobody ever locked their houses, nobody ever, oops, it really wants to be touched. Um, nobody ever locked their cars, they'd leave the keys and the ignitions of the cars on the street. Wellesley was a very safe place to be, and so when I got halfway through college, I said, you know, I think I should go someplace else and see what the rest of the world is like. Because, of course, with the singular lack of imagination, I also went to Wellesley College. So I really needed to get out of town. So I went. My mother put me on the train when I was 19 years old in Framingham, and I looked into her trusting hazel eyes and thought, she was about to send her eldest child 3,000 miles on the train by herself. I didn't think this was a big deal. Looking back on it, Maybe it was a bigger deal to her than I knew. But I looked at her and I thought, I don't know any other way to live, but there's gotta be something besides Wellesley, Massachusetts, and I'm going to find it. So I went to Berkeley, California, and I went back for three summers, 59, 60, and 61. They were years of great changes, and it was terrific. And I came home and said, someday I am gonna live in California. Well, it wasn't quite as quick as I'd hoped. It was 18 years later that I finally managed to get into a, onto a plane and go out to California to live. And Los Angeles gave me, a, a, it's a much longer story than this, but I got a call from San Francisco from the love of my life who said, come out and live with me and be my love. And as soon as I got there, he said, I want to live in LA. I said, Okay, so we went to Los Angeles. And it gave me the life I wanted. People were different. They weren't like Wellesley, Massachusetts at all, any of them. Nobody asked you where you went to school, which always meant college here. 
because you never knew where anybody went or whether they went to school. And back home, they said, where do you go to church? Because it was always church. In California, it could be anything. It could be Buddhism. It could be a temple. It could be... Um, California had a large variety of uh, religions to choose from. We also didn't have where you went to college, where you went to school, where you went to church. Ah, yes. And the other thing about New England is where you go in summer, because everything stops in June and picks up again in September. Well, in California, they go year round because they got summer all year round, and it's just great. It's like this all year round. Well, not quite. So that was lovely. For 30 years, I had the life I wanted. And then I, it was time, various pieces of my life had closed down, and I, it was time to go home. And where was home but Wellesley, Massachusetts? It was like going on a great, she really wants to be touched. It was, it was like being on a hot air balloon ride where you don't feel the wind because you're going with it and everything is just perfect. You've got, you can see the land around you, you can see the, when the mountains was where I was going up in hot air balloon rides. You could see the world. And I had seen the world in Los Angeles, but when I came back to Wellesley, Massachusetts, it was like landing in a hot air balloon, from a hot air balloon ride. Hard bump, 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 and then nothing. Wellesley was not what I had known, and it was not what I expected. And I had a major readjustment to make. It, 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 took, me, mm, it took me about 10 years, yeah. I've been back 11 years. It took about 10 to, to finally get, sort of get the hang of it. First of all, Wellesley wasn't dry anymore. Wellesley had beer and wine and hard liquor in the market. Nobody had that when I, when, when I left Wellesley. You voted, every, every year it came up for town meeting and they voted Wellesley dry. It, the, the Wellesley Inn could not serve drinks. That's how dry Wellesley was. <laughs> so I had a lot of adjustments to make. Uh, and it was, I discovered we'd had a John Birch Society club in Wellesley, Massachusetts in the 1950s. What? In my town? How could that be? Although, I also discovered there were Democrats in Wellesley, which there had not been when I left. So there were, there's, there were some very good adjustments to be able to make, but it took a long time to get past that. <clears throat> well, that's not the way we do things here. And it was, a st I was startled to be taken out for lunch by a childhood friend, and we were meeting two more people. We'd, both gone, we'd all gone to grade school together a long time ago. And she said, you know, um, you've had a very different kind of life from us. I said, mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't have children, but I got married and had a life. She said, no, 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 no. You lived in New York City. You lived in Los Angeles. You worked for Alex Haley. Oh my, nobody in Wellesley did that. So I had a lot of adjustments to make, um, but I fooled them all. I went to graduate school five years ago and got a master's in how to write my memories of my life and what it was really like. So I'm still in the process of making the adjustment, but it's been worth it. You're, you're reminding me of when I lived in California and I had been in Massachusetts for 57 years and then I moved to California and it was like I landed on another planet. It, it was an amazing culture shock. Yeah. And then coming back was like going through a vortex and yeah, that was quite something. Okay, our next open mic person is Lindsay Parent. Let's give her a hand. everyone that came out today. Um, this, month, this month is a month of adjustments. For me, it's been adjustment for the past three years. 
moving back home after going through a divorce and how my this is all about my how my faith has helped me through and some good adjustments had come with that and I'm writing a poem about in betweenish that's so that's where I am <laughs> give me one second in betweenish in many ways I am in between looking for a job searching for fulfillment value and self-worth in the middle of the mist of a lot of things the storm is slowly passing in this it's in between this transformation has been a, pro um, a process I need to be still slow down accept what is change what I can and knowing the difference the serenity, there in the middle, it is a growth, a spiritual awakening. God will use my experience towards him a blessing of more positive moments to come from beginning, middle, and end. He's going to take his time with me. He has not finished his masterpiece. I need to hold on to hope. The middle will come to a completion onto a newer beginning of green pastures, onto a new lens of how God sees me, not how anyone else does, because that's the only opinion that truly matters. Thank you very much. It's taking steps like that in using your voice that can make a huge adjustment in your life because it is very empowering. So, well done. That's why we're always looking for youth to come up too, because I know when I was younger, I never had a voice, um, believe it or not. And um, now you can't get the microphone away from me. But um, when we have, uh, I think it was last Coffee House, we had uh, little William Russell, who was nine years old, and he wrote a poem and read it. And just having the opportunity to give uh, a child a voice or a person a voice that doesn't usually have one. It is so very valuable, so yay for that. Next to last is Miss Sandra Elaine Scott. Let's give her a hand. You know, all I heard today and it's such a New England thing. Is it hot enough for ya? <laughs> I said, yes, and I embraced it. Because in New England, we are just never satisfied. So, on my birthday in March, it was nor'easter number 347.7, and it was snowing for the umpteenth time. And people were like, oh gosh, when is summer going to come? It's arrived. Yes! But do we think that? No. We go, is it hot enough for you? Oh my gosh, it's so hot. And oh my gosh, it is so hot. What, do you have AC? What do you mean you don't have AC? Well, what do you do? Um, what did we all do before AC became in fashion? And the best I heard was a friend of mine who had an argument with her husband. It was in the middle of the summer. And she said, do you know in the winter you would have the heat on for what you have the house at now. But we are never satisfied. We're always opposite of something else. And then when Sarah came in this evening and she and Thea were bantering and they were talking about stories and poems, it reminded me of a childhood poem that's all about being opposite. I want to see if you know how many opposites there are. One fine day, in the middle of the night, two dead boys got up to fight. 
Back to back, they faced each other with a knife. They shot each other. A deaf policeman heard the noise and came up to the two dead boys. If you believe this lie is true, go to the blind man. He saw it too. So yes, I will be embracing the heat. And when you see me sashaying down the street, wave, because summer, here you are. You are always a hot ticket. Never failing, thank you so much. That was fun. Okay, our last open mic, unless anybody else wants to contribute one before the last. Anybody open for it? Jeanette? No? Okay. Um, it's going to be Miss Thea. She's going to join us up here. And hopefully she will fix our microphone when we take a break. So, which mic do I use? Ooh. Yeah, very confusing. I won't touch. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, her name was Diane Ross. We made a documentary together because she wanted to learn video editing and because she had a story to tell. She said her story was about adding an addition to her house. The house was in uh, North Long Beach on Poppy Street and she wanted to use feminist principles. So she had a woman builder. She had eight volunteers one of which, which was a nursing mother, and she had some power tools. <laughs> but the real story was Diane herself. She was four foot high. She had a very gnarled body. First 11 years of her life, she had juvenile arthritis. And she was in constant, excruciating pain. And the only reason she survived was because of her father, who was a physical therapist. And he taught her to have a positive attitude toward life with a capital P. And he always said, there's Diane's way, and there's everybody else's way. And he did whatever he could, making adjustments for everything around her so that she had a viable life, and she did. And even though she was stuck in that body, she's the kind of person that just blazes through your life and teaches you everything that you ever needed to know. We met at a, uh, a camp. SCWU camp, that's Southern California Women for Understanding, which was uh, a euphemism for a lesbian camp. <laughs> and we were sitting next to each other at one of the uh, uh, dinners, and we started talking. And you know, you don't just turn to somebody and say, "Well, what's wrong with your hands?" Because I was, um, I was a neuroscientist. True story. I. Um, I told her that I studied hands and I was studying how your brain controls your hands and I was always interested about the different shapes of hands and she showed me hers, these little paddles with these tiny stubby fingers that were useless. She said she was a lesbian witch, an angry lesbian witch with a positive attitude, a happy, angry, <laughs> lesbian witch. I believed in feminist principles. So in the documentary, she talks about some of these principles. She said that um, 
For example, if you weren't having fun, then you weren't supposed to work. And then another principle was, if you're having, um, you're kind of off on, on a bad focus day, then wear a blue star on your forehead. That way everybody knows that you shouldn't use the power tools. <laughs> <laughs> they built, the, they had the foundation and they poured uh, yellow rose petals through the whole foundation before all the cement was put on, was put in it. And then they took the drywall and they laid it out on the ground and they, uh, they traced their bodies on the drywall and then inside the walls they put messages and flowers and petals and then they put the drywall up. So it was just infusing this, this addition to the house with this, this incredible feminine energy to it. And then she told us on the video, she talks about the time cards. Because you see, everybody had to fill out time cards. And you didn't fill out uh, what you did. What you did, what you filled out was what you learned that day. And she, in the video, she starts telling this, this story about this, this young disabled woman who filled out a time card and she said, today I learned how to multiply. And I'm looking at Diane in this video and, and she's breaking through the wall from the old house to the new house. She's standing there on these stubby legs of hers and she's just breaking into her new life and just looking at her, she's just a saint in action. i never met anybody like her. And there was more, um, the video took a long time to make. I mean, if you've ever done video editing. <laughs> so night after night, there, were, there was more angry lesbian witches around, you know, in the, and we were all sitting around and night after night we were talking and, and doing the editing. And at one point, uh, Diane gets this idea. She said, you know, in those consciousness raising groups, um, there was, you know, people would, would sit around and they would, Sometimes they would um, show their, uh, their, you know, sort of like in the vagina monologues, they would show their insides of their private parts to each other. And she said, well, we should do that someday. She would have, too. I chickened out. <laughs> she was fearless. She died when she was uh, 58 years old. Her bones were fused. She was in excruciating pain again but she had a smile on her face because she lived like 50 years longer than she ever would have. I learned so much from Diana. I think about her every day. I think about how she taught me not to track what I do, but to track what I learn each day. And she taught me that I'm not perfect, that if I'm having an off day, just wear a blue star on my forehead. And she taught me to live life in joy, no matter the circumstances. And that I should share all of myself with everybody. Well, not all of myself. And to use lots and lots of petals and spread them around. Thank you very much. This is Diane. You can take a look uh, closer. It's from the video. It's on YouTube. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so we are going to take a break and help yourself to lots of goodies. And uh, when we come back, we're going to welcome Tom Smith up. And he's going to entertain us with his wonderful music. OK? So, in introducing Tom Smith, in the words of noted WUMB-FM Boston radio DJ Dave Palmeter, contrary to what a lot of people think, folk music is still a living tradition. It's a living tradition that feeds on new songs that speak of people's wants, people's needs, people's struggles, and people's triumphs. So true. Tom Smith is more out of the tradition of, say, Pete Seeger and Tom Paxton than Jackson Brown or Connor Oberst. 
He's a man who writes songs that seem like they've always been there. There are very few songwriters working today that I would call folk singers, but I would call Tom Smith a true folk singer. Please welcome him to the microphone. Thank you. What a lovely evening you had. My first time here, and I've enjoyed every person who came up. We'll probably come back. So we're singing and talking about making adjustments, right? Breathe in, breathe out. Slow down, you move too fast. You got to make the morning last. Just kicking down the cobblestones. Looking for fun, I'm feeling groovy. Slow down now. Da 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 da. But you know when I come to watch your flowers growing, ain't you got no rhymes for me? Doo doo da, feeling goofy. Now your chorus goes da 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 da. Good. Da 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 da. No places to go, no promises to keep. I'm dappled and drowsy and ready for sleep. Let your morning time drop all its petals on me. Life, I love you, all is groovy. Da -da. was not mine, that was Paul Simon. So this one may at first not seem like it's a making adjustments sort of theme. Hang with me, please. And it has a refrain. You sing the last two lines of every verse, right? This story is old. It is not often told. But now is the time to restore it In an old-fashioned way It is meant to convey A warning to those who ignore it There once was a frog Lived in desperate times In most ways just like many others This frog was poor with no food in his store just like those of his sisters and brothers. This frog was poor, no food in his store, like those of his sisters and brothers. Got it? From under a log, quite close to the frog, a scorpion rose to address him. And from what I heard, I don't think his words came with the best of intention. I must cross this lake, the scorpion said, 
kindly I ask you consider, for I can't swim the gap. Take me on your back, I'll reward you with gold and with silver. I can't swim the gap. Take me on your back, I'll reward you with gold and with silver. The frog then replied, I've seen many die by the power you wield with your venom. What kind of assurance can you provide that I'll not be counted among them? Yes, I have a great stinger, the scorpion said, and I'm not afraid to address this. If I used it on you, then I would drown too, and that's not in our mutual interest. If I used then I would drown too, and that's not in our mutual interest. So with the promise of gain and no thought of pain, the frog did agree to enlist. He could contain the scorpion's campaign, at least it was an acceptable risk. The frog with the scorpion swam from the shore and then beyond all comprehension halfway across in spite of the cost the scorpion delivered his poison halfway across in spite of the cost the scorpion delivered his poison The frog, through his pain, with tears did exclaim, Now we will both meet our maker. But the scorpion proclaimed, You are to blame, for you knew that this is my nature. Now that my story has come to an end, It's custom I tell you the lesson. Make sure you don't fail, to consider this tale when you vote in the midterm election. <laughs> Make sure you don't fail to consider this tale when you vote in the midterm election. <laughs> Thank you for sticking with me on that. I heard that old fable uh, listening to the moth. You, I'm sure you've listened to the moth. And there was a, a, a skillful teller of, of tale wove that uh, pieces of that fable into her uh, story, his story. And I thought that would make a perfect song. I'm having trouble this week. I don't mind sharing that with you, as I'm reading the front pages. And I, I process this through music. And so, this is my fake it till you make it song. You know that expression? I spread my wings, little tongue, when the sun comes up. The whole world spins in a coffee cup. I got a magic wand from the Milky Way. Wake up, it's a grand new day. It's a grand new day. It's a grand new day. Wake up, it's a grand new day. Try it. It's a grand new day. It's a grand new day. Wake up, it's a grand new day. Dandelions like powder puffs. It's a perfect time to fall in love. 
a bluebird song and a feather spray. Wake up, it's a grand new day. It's a grand new day. It's a grand new day. Wake up, it's a grand new day. I displaced my grief with the will to care. I shed that thief we call despair. Here comes the dawn, I'm unafraid. Wake up, it's a grand new day. It's a grand new day. Yeah, it's a grand new day. Wake up, it's a grand new day. A day when I will turn myself around I'll make things better than I found Please lend a hand, there's a lot to do There's a tree to plant and an attitude There's a heart to mend and a world to save It's a grand new day. It's a grand new day. Wake up, it's a grand new day. It's a grand new day. It's a grand new day. Wake up, it's a grand new day. It's a grand new day. This, this song is explicitly about making adjustments. There's just no doubt I sort of call this my singing autobiography. Maybe you'll recognize yourself in this thing. It has a chorus, which I dare you to sing. Not easy, and I'm not going to teach it to you. <laughs> Life is a road trip. I start up the car and sit next to my old banjo and my two bit guitar. I'm destined for fame. I just program the address. This all seems so simple with my GPS. But the signs are confusing, and I'm starting to doubt if I'll ever get there before all my money runs out. The road is full of potholes, and I'm running out of gas when I hear this advice. It comes from my GPS. Recalculating as you travel life's highway en route to your star. It's the roadblocks you find that refine who you are. And the detours you take help you make the best songs. Decide what's important. Turn right, then move on. I like my day job. I love my wife. We don't need much money, we have a great life. Our one bedroom condo and little sports car are just perfect for two. I think I'll buy another guitar. I'll try out a Gibson, a Martin, why not? It'll look great next to that new banjo I bought. Then a phone call from home changed my path in a flash. I am pregnant, she said. Seek advice from the dash. 
recalculating as you travel life's highway and route to your star. It's the roadblocks you find that refine who you are, and the detours you take help you make the best songs. Decide what's important, turn right, then move on. I hear some of you. In just a few years, we both can retire. I'll play my guitar every day by the fire. I'll sing and write songs, drink lattes, eat scones. I've crossed all the T's. There are no more unknowns. It's just Margot and me and our empty nests. I met with a planner. I've learned to invest. Sure, we have a mortgage and some loans to repay, but I can depend on my 401k. Oops, <laughs> recalculating. As you travel life's highway en route to your star, it's the roadblocks you find that refine who you are. And the detours you take help you make the best songs decide what's important. Turn right, then move on. So it looks like retirement is not meant for me. And fame, that's not all that it's cracked up to be. Our kids move back in with kids of their own. There go my lattes. There go my scones. My name now is Bop Bop, and Margo is Bam. Our grandkids renamed us, but I know who I am, and I credit the detours that I took in my life, and the voice from the dashboard that gave this advice. As you travel life's highway en route to your star, It's the roadblocks you find that refine who you are. And the detours you take help you make the best songs. Decide what's important. Turn right, then move on. So when you come to a roadblock, or if you're stuck in a rut, it's more about how you make choices and less about what choices you make. Though some may turn out wrong, just decide what's important and turn right and move on. Just decide what's important, turn right, then move on. did retire not too long ago. I'm going to have to probably read this one because I just, I just wrote it. When I was growing up, my mother, she had this folksy kind of humor and she would, she had great expressions. For example, I think she's invented them. I've never heard some of them. Like, uh, if, if she were alive today and wanted to respond to the, the president, she would say, oh, he's just whistling up a drain pipe. Isn't that a great, a great folky expression? And I grew up in Pennsylvania, and there were a lot of Pennsylvania Dutch farmers there, and they had great expressions like, uh, I, I worked for this farmer uh, next door to us, and he said, Tommy, throw the cow over the fence some hay. <laughs> That's the way the Pennsylvania Dutch talk about it. And, and, and I used to play mandolin a lot. I played all these fiddle tunes, and fiddle tunes have great names. And so when I needed a song uh, for my retirement, I decided I'll just throw all these expressions and 
fiddle tune names all into the song. Whistle up a drain pipe, pigeon on a gate, throw away the pinstripes, time to celebrate with a corn stock fiddle and a bowl. Oh, ain't gonna work no more. Gonna hum to the beat of a rum tum tittle, gonna drum my feet like spittle on a griddle, gonna bleat like a sheep from the edge to the middle of a tune on the old banjo. Oh, ain't gonna work no more. Turkey in a peat patch, huckleberry wine, grasshopper sitting on a sweet potato vine, throw the cow or the fence some hay. Hey, ain't gonna work today. Gonna hum to the beat of a rum tum tittle, gonna drum my feet like spittle on a griddle, gonna bleat like a sheep from the edge to the middle of a tune on the old banjo. Oh, ain't gonna work no more. Ducks in the mill pond, possum up a tree, Polly put the kettle on, have a cup of tea, gonna give the fiddler a dram, damn, ain't gonna work again. Gonna hum to the beat of a rum tum tittle, gonna drum my feet like spittle on a griddle, gonna bleat like a sheep from the edge to the middle of a tune on the old banjo. Oh, ain't gonna work no more. Gonna hum to the beat of a rum tum tittle, drum my feet like spittle on a griddle, gonna bleat like a sheep from the edge to the middle of a tune on the old banjo. Oh, ain't gonna work no more. Facebook. Well, I started this Facebook group. I'm a, I'm a songwriter, and I wanted to uh, uh, I wanted to encourage people to write topical songs. And so I created this Facebook group called the Topical Songwriters Alliance. And we were having various discussions there about topical songs. And how there's probably, I think I'm correct in this, there's probably never been a song that's actually changed somebody's mind if they, if they were set. You know, I don't know how many of you have had conversations with people, especially about politics. If you're of a different mindset, you know, you, you basically have to give up uh, after a while. It's really a shame. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes not the case, but... So I was thinking, you know, maybe there aren't any songs that really could change people's minds. So I decided I would write a song that kind of uh, processes through how my mind changed about one particular topic. I grew up white in northeastern Pennsylvania, dirt poor, and nobody gave me nothing. So it's my attitude. I work for everything I got. And that was the basis for my thinking about this conversation I had with several people about this song. When I looked up to the flag with my young hand upon my breast Proud of the nation that we had I swore allegiance with a pledge Written on my classroom wall with liberty and justice for all. All my goals were in my sight. What I worked for I could win. 
I knew my future would be bright A privilege granted by my skin From the white side of the wall I saw liberty and justice for all Now hatred has removed its mask Emboldened by the choice we made The stars and bars flies from the mast We fortify our barricade How can we boast of freedom behind walls Without liberty and justice for all Scarred by anger and by grief I unfurl that tattered rag To raise a dream I still believe I pledge to tear down my walls To build liberty and justice for all. I pledge to tear down my walls, to build liberty and justice for all. came home like the, like the day I, uh, I tried out for the JV basketball team this was in a tiny little rural school in Pennsylvania I tried out for the JV basketball team I wasn't that bad of a basketball player but eight of us Try it out for the basketball team. You know how many people there are on a basketball team? Five. Five. Plus subs, right? I was the only person who didn't make it. <laughs> I came home and I told my mother. She knew that I was a little upset. She just said, well, did you do the best you can? And I said, yeah. And she said, I'm happy with that. Uh, she... Uh, spoke to me as I was thinking about what would inspire me, you know, and she inspired, inspired me. Just do the best you can, that's what she, so when I'm faced with what's going on in the world today, I just wanted to say, okay, I'm doing the best I can. That's moving us forward, moving me forward, I'm staying emotionally healthy, that's good. And I was thinking of other people who inspired me besides my mother, and one is the person in, in this first, verse. I think you'll recognize him, but I won't tell you who it is. And in the second verse, I was writing this in my little cabin in New Hampshire, and up in the rafters of the uh, porch was this little Phoebe bird, and she had a nest full of little 
Phoebe birds. And she was going back and forth, stuffing their tummies with caterpillars. And that was inspiring to me. And An old man on a stage, his age belies the power of his song. With a voice that may be shaky, he clearly sings of making right from wrong. Because he's old, he is told it's time to bring your singing to an end. He replied, as long as I can play my banjo, I will do the best I can. I'll do the best I can. I don't listen to the noise. I wake up and take a stand, put my heart into my voice. Stones are smoothed by grains of sand, even though I'm just one man. I do the best I can. That Phoebe in the rafters of my front porch does not stop to take a rest. When she hears that music flowing from her feathered offspring filling up her nest. To and fro, bugs in tow, on a task that never seems to end. I ask her how she does it, and she tells me, I do the best I can. I do the best I can. I don't listen to the noise. I don't claim to understand. I do not have a choice, but I'll sing in the end. This is where it all began. That's why I do the best I can. Sometimes I count myself among the many who are ready to give up. You too. Perhaps we're starting way too late and the distance is too great to make it up. Step by step we can get farther from the start than from the end. For the sake of all my children and their children, I will do the best I can. I'll do the best I can. I don't listen to the noise. I woke up, I'll take a stand, put my heart into my voice. I will get there in the end. I'll sing it once again. I do the best I can. Do the best you can. Don't listen to the noise. Wake up. Take a stand, put your heart into your voice. You will get there in the end. Every woman, child, and man, do the best you can. We will get there in the end, if together, hand in hand, we do the best we can. Thea, how much time do we have there? Oh, 15 more minutes. Okay. This is uh, a very personal kind of uh, adjustment. Um, uh, I, just, I think I'll just let the song sing. The things I needed you to say You kept them safely stowed away Is something wrong with me That you could not read the signs That I gave to show the way The lines of love and loneliness are blurred In the space between your words
Some words take courage to speak. Those arrows never left your sheath. To risk they missed their mark. To say what's in your heart would expose where you were weak. But hurt can be delivered, though unheard, in the space between your words. Rust is like the burning of the sun. It was too slow for me to see when I was young. Like trust can span the distance that is spun between a father and his son. Time heals all wounds I've heard it said. My scars have faded where I bled. Now that I've reached your age, the day you went away, I can say with no regret, I told my son what I believe I heard in the space between your words. You told me in the only way you could, in the space between your words. two more here. Uh, this, this one I wrote just uh, two months ago. My daughter was feeling the need uh, for adjustments in her life. She's 31. And uh, so she said, I'm just, I, need, I need a major change in my life. I'm going to go to Aaron, the Isle of Erin off Scotland and I'm going to study herbology. <laughs> so she went there for two months and I just picked her up yesterday and then she's gonna get on a plane and go back to Scotland in, in a month or so to get a master's degree in business. So she's gonna combine her creative energies and her uh, love of plants and yoga and wellness and mindfulness and she's going to start a wellness center so I thought well with this you know in my family we when important things have we inter turn important pages they deserve a song you know births deaths marriages all kinds of things and uh, so I wrote her an old Scottish folk song <laughs> See if you could sing the chorus. So the idea was write a song that sounded like it sounded like it was written a long time ago. And the uh, uh, if you heard the stories of the selkies, you know the selkies. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, selkie is this uh, seal that has the ability to transform herself, often a female but not always, into a human by taking off her her seal coat and in the old stories often she gets lured on shore from the singing of the uh, of humans and she wants to walk among humans and she becomes human and uh, then a lot of times in the stories they hide her sulky cloak so she can't go back because somebody falls in love with her but at any rate and she always goes back and that's the end of the story you know somehow she figures a way to go back 
But I decided I would write a song from the point of view of the sulky, who after going back, decided I want to return for something there that drove her. I wrote the whole thing in the Scottish dialogue. But I'll only sing the chorus in the dialect so that I don't have to explain it to you. The verses, that is. Here's the chorus. I'm no a water by the wall. I'm no a water leave you. I'm no a water by the wall. I'll I come back to see you. Do not go away to stay away. I know a water by the wall. I do not go away to leave you. I know a water leave you. And then repeat the first line. I do not go away to stay away. I know a water by the wall. I will always come back to see you. I'll I come back to see you. Give it a try. I know a water by the wall. I know a water leave you. I know a water by the wall. I'll I come back to see you. I know it when I hear your song That I'll cast off my tether To sing and dance again Among the thistle and the heather I know I want to bite a one I know I want to leave you I know I want to bite a one I'll I come back to see you. I do not fear the ocean wide to join my heart's companion, to ride the promise of the Clyde returning with the salmon. I know I want to bite a one. I know I want Thank you, Thea, for asking me to join you this evening and for doing, keeping this wonderful community of s spoken word, poems, and music to going on, which we really need. Thank you, Shirley, for hosting. Thank you, Sandra, for monitoring the gate back there, and all the people who brought cookies and and the great open micers.
co-wrote this with my friend Bob Blue. Bob Blue had MS, and as things were getting worse, just like that storyteller told, like Thea told of that woman uh, with uh, juvenile arthritis, po he just had a positive, positive attitude. And I said, Bob, how do you keep such a positive disposition? And he said, well, I think about songs that inspire me. And we started talking about songs that inspire both of us. And we hit on two songs, one by the great Canadian folk singer Stan Rogers, and the other by the great uh, folk uh, songwriter Anonymous. <laughs> and we combined the two of them together. sun dried up all the rain so the eensy weensy spider climbed again she would not let her elements distract her from her goal the purpose of her journey was embedded in her soul so let the sun shine down on beasts and women and on men be like that eensy weensy spider rise again rise again rise again never let misfortune keep you from doing what you can so whether your legs number two four six or eight or ten be like that eatsy weensy spider rise again This eensy weensy metaphor is a lesson for us all. We cannot be defeated if we rise each time we fall. And if you think this story's one you've heard too long ago, then think about some other ones you know. You've heard the myth of Sisyphus, and you know Jack and Jill. It's such a potent image going up and down a hill. So every time you fall and lose some skin off of your chin, be like that eensy weensy spider, rise again, rise again, rise again. Never let misfortune keep you from doing what you can. So whether your legs number two, four, six, or eight, or ten, be like that eensy weensy spider, rise again. think this allegory has gone a bit too far. Climbing up a pipe is not like reaching for a star. But whether it's a water spout or mountain that you climb, you've come this far, indulge me one more time. <laughs> it can be said that each of us climbs up a water spout. The downward push of gravity is not what it's about. The upward pull of hope is what will save us in the end. Be like that eensy weensy spider, rise again. Here we go. Rise again, rise again, yeah. Never let misfortune keep you from doing what you can. So whether your legs number two, four, six, or eight, or ten, be like that eensy weensy spider, rise again, rise again, rise again. Never let misfortune keep you from doing what you can. Whether your legs number two, four, six, or eight, or ten, be like that eensy weensy spider, rise again.
loved your messages about hope and doing the best we can, and it, it was wonderful. Thank you very much. I wanted to say that Tom has CDs up there, $10 a piece. You can visit Sandra. Uh, you can hear that message over and over again if you get one. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. That was, that was wonderful. Good. Yeah. Next month, our coffee house is on July 28th. Make a note in your calendar. We're going to have a feature and open mic again and more goodies, and uh, we can join with each other and enjoy each other through the summer. Um, it's wonderful. A lot of coffee houses close down through the summer, but we keep it going because we know the importance of um, sharing our stories and community. So important. Uh, let's see. Anything else? That's it. That's it. Happy summer. Happy summer, yes. Come back. Please come back. Thank you for coming. And thank you, and again, Tom. Thank you again, Tom. And thank you. And I want to say, Susan, you are helping us so much. Sandra is helping us. It's four of us that put this coffee house together tonight. So um, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Medfield TV, community shows.